Hey, it's Clay. Welcome to another video. Today, I want to talk about amplifier safety. Amplifier safety. Amplifier safety. Amplifier safety. Amplifier safety. This is a pretty big hurdle, I think, for a lot of people that are interested in maybe building amps, but maybe they've tinkered around with other electronics, they built pedals, they've replaced the pickups in their guitar, always maybe wanted to build an amp, but have never gotten over the threshold of doing it. I think a lot of it is out of concern about the fear of being safe. And to start off with, I don't want to minimize that fear or that risk. I think it's extremely important for everyone that gets involved with tube amps to have a very healthy fear of the safety concerns. And that should never go away. Even as somebody that has built a number of tube amps successfully and is active in the hobby, I still feel like it is important for me to be just as afraid of the concern as, as a new beginner. And I think that that is a fear that you should carry through with you through the, your entire life. Um, but where I maybe differ with some is that a lot of people will give it this disclaimer of saying, you know, tube amps are dangerous. Only go inside a tube amp if you are an experienced professional. Well, to me, that was always kind of a catch-22 because how do you become that experienced professional you know, it's like only build a tube amp if you can build a tube amp. Well, how do you learn how to become that experienced professional? And, you know, on the other side of that coin as well, you know, I certainly acknowledge that there is safety concern and there is a very strong need to be safe. But there are a lot of activities that people do all the time that have danger. Driving a car, shooting a gun, going snorkeling, playing sports. You know, all of these things have carry with them the ability to potentially become injured or even die if you are not safe or careful with what you're doing. I think the difference is that with many of those kinds of activities, there's a much better and robust path towards moving out of that zone where you're a beginner, you have no idea what you're doing, into somebody that does have some knowledge and experience and can greatly minimize those safety concerns through education. And I think that in the amp world, there's a little bit of a don't even get started. And and I guess I want to maybe help kind of bridge that gap. So I'm here to, in this video, my goal is going to be to try to provide you guys with some information about how to proceed safely with tube amps. This exactly what this is going to be, information. And I would still encourage you guys to take the next step and try to maybe find out a person or find a community of people that can help walk you through this process to complement this information just like if you're learning how to drive a car, right? We don't stick a 16-year-old in a car by himself and say, go for it. First, we make him go through driver's ed. So he has that knowledge basis to begin with. And then you send him off with an instructor to help teach him practically how to drive that car and how to apply that knowledge. So I think we should probably be doing the same type of thing here in the amp world. So my goal is to kind of cover step one as far as giving you guys some information that you can digest through YouTube. Next, I just want to speak a little bit about my history with tube amps. Um, I have no formal training in electronics. My education and profession is the furthest thing that it could be from electronics and, and phys physical manual labor or creating or building things of any kind. I learned everything that I know about tube amps from the internet, from YouTube, from different forums, from watching posts or reading through things. And so I guess I'm a testament that anybody can do it, right? If you've got a computer and the ability to read and watch, you can learn. Um, it just takes some effort and, and some, some desire to, to kind of proceed through a lot of that information to find what helps you. And I also remember pretty vividly the first time I cracked open uh, my tube amp, it was an Epiphone Valve Junior, and I had studied tutorials and guides about how to safely operate a tube amp for weeks. But finally, I got to that point where, you know, I just, you got to physically open that thing up for the first time. You have to physically touch that electrolytic capacitor for the first time. And you hope that the steps that you've done take you to that point, get, are you safe? And I guess I was determined enough to proceed through that, and I did so safely. But I guess I also would encourage you guys to take this video, like I said, and pair it with, you know, find someone else in the community that can help you, uh, maybe in person, or can show you the ropes. Uh, I think there's a lot of great people in this community, so, so let's kind of band together a little bit more to help proceed through that. So to start off with, I want to talk a little bit about electricity. I'm not going to go into this deeply as because I'm not an electrical engineer and I don't have mastery over this part of the subject, but I just want to talk a little bit about the basics of electricity so that you guys gain a knowledge base of what is happening so you can appreciate the risk a little bit more accurately. 
So starting with the most fundamental question, why is electricity even dangerous? Electricity flows, and as a part of that, your body is an electrical circuit, right? All of the nerve activity in your body from your brain to all your nerve endings is done by electrical impulses. Your skin is conductive to the flow of electricity. So if you and your body, and specifically your hands, ever come into contact with an electrical flow, like there is inside a tube amp, that will flow through your body. And so that's the primary concern, is if you ever touch something in your amp that is hot with voltage, that voltage and current will now be traveling through your body and can create some real problems. Next, be aware that there are two main variables, actually a third as well, that you need to be mindful of when appreciating this risk. Those are voltage, current, and then the third one is resistance. The voltage and current are really the two properties of electricity that really determine the risk. A lot of people, when talking about safety, I think as a layperson, think more about voltage. You know, these tube amps have high voltages, sometimes upwards of 500 volts DC. And that's true and correct, but the real concern is the current that is flowing. And current flow is, is really the mark of when things get dangerous. Now, current and voltage have a relationship together that's defined by Ohm's law. And so, you know, as certainly as you, if you have higher voltage, you know, the, the current that would flow has more potential to, to be more dangerous. But really, the, that voltage number alone is not inherently dangerous. You could have 1,000 volts, and if the current is like 0. 0.000001 of an amp, it's not going to be dangerous. On the other hand, you could have a low amount of voltage that has a very high current that could become very dangerous. So I think I want to shift the, dire the concern more to the current ratings of what's going on than the voltage. Now to give a little more context to that, certainly encourage you guys to do a little more of your research. I checked out uh, the HSA, Health and Safety Organization, website, and they give some guidelines for, for uh, when electricity can become dangerous. And they're talking about one volt through one ohm of resistance, which is a little bit of an unrealistic application for guitar amps, but just to give you some baseline there. With that parameters, um, five milliamps of current is probably fine. You get up to about 10 or 20, and you're going to start really feeling it. It's going to be uncomfortable. You, at some point, you get to the place where your muscles start to spasm, and you actually lose control. Again, you're starting to interfere with those electrical impulses from your brain to even command you to let go. Uh, and as you start getting into like 30, 40, 50, it's really going to start to become dangerous. Um, if you get to about 100 to 2 to 300 milliamps, that's when you start talking about you know those medical shows like Grey's Anatomy when the, the, the doctors bring in the defibrillator and they're yelling, clear! and they give this person a shock, um, that kind of current flow will interfere with the beating of your heart. So that's certainly where the fatality concern comes into play when you start to get to that level of current. So then let's go back a little bit, and I mentioned resistance. Um, like I said, your skin is conductive. When you touch electricity, electricity will flow through your skin. Now, electricity typically will try to find the path of least resistance. And it's going to want to find, probably typically is going to like to see a path to ground. Now, the weird part about it is your body has a amount of resistance, right? You can actually measure it. If you put a current through your skin, you could measure the amount of resistance that's being presented. But the amount of resistance that your body has is variable. And it's subject to a lot of different things. You know, are, are you wet? Or are you dirty? Um, how far away are things? What other paths are in line, right? This, this can get very complex and complicated, but uh, it's not a fixed measurement. It, it varies depending on how uh, you're in contact with different things. Then let's also talk about the voltage component. Let's talk a little bit about the flow of voltage through a tube amp. What you're looking at here is the inside of my 5 e 3 Tweed Deluxe that I built in a cake pan. I've got more videos on this channel about this build if you want to check it out. But I'm using this mostly for demonstration purposes to outline the flow of voltage in a typical tube amp. First we've got the power cord. The power cord enters in the amp right here, and the power cord is going to be plugged into the wall. The wall, I live in the United States, is rated for approximately 120 volts of alternating current. Now, 120 volts AC might vary a little bit, and actually, typically, when I measure the voltage coming out of my wall, it's typically a little bit higher, somewhere in the range of 123, 124 volts AC. Now, this voltage from the wall is, you know, certainly potentially dangerous. It can shock you, and it's, you know, if you've ever 
had a kid stick a fork into the wall, you know, you've experienced what that's like. And so you really want to be mindful of that. And that's going to come in over here on this power supply input side. Uh, so certainly be aware of the 123, 120 volts of AC coming in from the wall. Then we have the power transformer. That's these wires coming out here. The job of the power transformer is to take that 120 volts of AC from the wall and it has a winding ratio that will multiply up that voltage through the miracle of induction. And uh, you know, typically that is going to put it somewhere in the range of maybe 300 to 400 volts AC. For example, a typical deluxe-ish uh, power transformer will get to about 330 volts AC. And that's going to go to the high voltage or B plus uh, power supply line. And that's typically those high voltage lines are rated for 100, 200 maybe even 300 milliamps of current, depending on the type of power tubes that you're going to supply. You know, this amp is running 6V6s, which two 6V6s typically needs, uh, an individual 6V6 needs 45 milliamps of current flowing through it, um, roughly. So that's two times two, that's 90. So that already we've talked about about 100 milliamps of, of current, maybe even a little bit more than that. And that's the maximum output rating for that high voltage. So you could have... 350 volts AC at 120 milliamps of current flowing on that high voltage line. And that's going to be coming off these red wires here going to our rectifier. So now next comes the rectifier. All tube amps will have a rectifier of some kind that will take that alternating current and rectify it into direct current. Direct current will typically take your volt alternating your AC voltage rating and by about a factor of about 1.4, increase it and modify it into kind of a rough form DC. So if you had a 350 volts AC, that's going to be 500 volts DC at that high current, maybe 100 to 200 milliamp current rating. So that is really the danger and the concern there. And that's, So that's going to be coming out of one of these yellow wires going right here to these three filter capacitors. Now that's the next point in the circuit to really highlight. The filter capacitors are probably the most uh, concerning point in a tube amp that you hear the most about. In this amp, that those are these three guys right here. And the reason why those are concerning is because one of the jobs that a capacitor does is to store electricity. It actually keeps it within itself for a period of time. This could happen even for a couple of days and continue even after the amp is powered off and unplugged. And if a, fil if a filter capacitor... Um, becomes faulty, it actually may store that voltage even longer. And so that really is the concern, right? Even though this amp is not plugged in, it is possible that there could be a high voltage on these filter caps. Now I've measured it to make sure that that's not true as I, I you know, would not poke around in one if I didn't know it was safe. But uh, that is the primary concern is that those filter capacitors could store a dangerous amount of voltage. These filter capacitors here are rated for 475 volts. Of DC, so you know certainly um, at that high current level we talked about could definitely be very uh, very dangerous. So now as we're looking at the amp, what I want to do is kind of explain to you guys what could be the worst case scenario, and I think this is helpful to really highlight what not to do, so then you can also know what to do, kind of by contrast, and so. Again, this amp is not live, but um, this chassis, I'm, this is the amplifier chassis. The chassis is the metal box that the amp sits in. It's very much common practice that you would ground the chassis. So there's going to be a wire that goes into this power cord <coughs> and, you know, going to the, the end of this guy. And this middle tip here is going to be actually connected to literal earth ground and will discharge all, all of the ground signals that way. And so, you know, if, let's say I've got one hand here kind of supporting or holding the chassis just to stabilize. And let's say I've got my other hand here and I'm just kind of poking around or I'm doing some soldering or I'm mucking around with something. And let's say, you know, I'm, I'm poking around here and I actually touch and my finger comes into contact. We said this is my high voltage line right here to this leg of the capacitor. Now what I've effectively done is recalls from our discussion from earlier, right? I've given the electricity a path to go into my finger, travel up through my right arm, travel through my chest, and now is going to come out my left arm 
into the chassis, and that is giving it a source and a path to ground, right? Electricity is going to want to follow the path of least resistance. Like as I said earlier, the body does have some amount of resistance, but it's probably lower than everything else you got going on in here with these resistors. So it's going to probably look at your body, and especially if maybe you're wet, maybe you just took a shower, if you're clean, you're not dirty, you know, your, your fingers are, are not calloused or something like that, you know, there's, there's a good path to ground. And so now you have that high voltage going through your chest, and if that happens at the exact wrong moment with the cadence and the rhythm of your heart, you could actually interrupt that rhythm and your heart, heart could stop beating. And if there's no one there around to help you pretty quickly, you will die. So that really is the worst case scenario of what you could do. So now that we've talked worst case scenario, let's talk a little bit about some good practice measurements to use when you're pre working inside of an amp. First and foremost, I would recommend that you guys secure the amp. So what I've done here, um, this is not maybe even best practice, I'm just going to call this good practice, but I actually have the amp on one end is sitting on the power transformer, and then the other end is I'm using this spool of wire. This is not even great practice. I think it would be even better to have it so that the amp is completely secure. As you can see, this is prone to a little bit of wobbling. And, and I would not actually really feel comfortable working inside a live amp sitting in this condition. So this is really for display purposes. Some guys will use um, some w blocks of wood or some um, books to build up the chassis so it sits a little more stably. That would be a great option. Other guys I know have used the, some woodworking skills to build a cradle that'll actually grab and kind of clamp on the amp on both sides and give you an absolutely secure um, amp chassis. And the main reason there is if the chassis is prone to wobbling, you know, while you're going to be pushing and poking in there, you may have a slip occur and that could cause an inadvertent contact. And that's really where the bad news is, is going to occur. So make sure that your amp is secure. Number two, I think you should always assume that the amp is full of dangerous electricity. You should always assume that these capacitors are full of charge and need to be discharged unless you know certainly that they are not. Never assume that they are discharged. Oh, maybe the amp's been off for a couple days or even years. Still, don't assume. Make, you know, ensure that they, the amp is safe to work on and never make assumptions. Next, I recommend that you guys build one of these. This is a discharging tool. Basically, what this does is it gives you the ability to safely discharge these capacitors in a very reliable manner. What I've got here are two alligator clips that I got from Radio Shack and then I've got a length of wire and in between I have soldered a resistor and I've just covered it up with duct tape so I don't have loose ends and the idea is that you can use this to give the high voltage a path to ground so that it will bleed off. So what you would want to do is like if I've got these filter capacitors here plug it on both sides of the filter cap because with a filter cap you always have one side that's positive and the other side that's negative negative. and so any voltage that is stored in the capacitor will travel through your discharge tool and to ground and be safely discharged now you want to have some amount of resistance if you just used a bare wire it would discharge but it would happen in an instant and there would be a pretty loud and alarming pop and spark that would occur that would not be very pleasant so you don't want to do that um, the value of the resistor, you need to have a higher wattage. I think I've got a two or three watt resistor in here right now. And you need that just to make sure that you can work with higher voltages. If you use like a quarter watt resistor, uh, that's going to limit you pretty big for what you could work on. And then that there's really maybe no point to it. So maybe a two, three, five watt resistor would be really good. Then the value of the resistor is also somewhat important. Uh, I think something even like 100 ohms is fine. You know, if it gets too low, then you do run that risk of a shock or a spark. Uh, but if it gets too high, then it'll just discharge very, very slowly. And it might take like 10 minutes to discharge. So I think I've got something, I think mine's about 470 ohms. And that's worked totally fine for me. Uh, and, and that's a, a recommendation that I would make. And then, yeah, you just saw it. You get one end of, a, of an alligator clip, solder on, and another end. 
Now I like to have two alligator clips. I would very, very much recommend you have at least one. And then if your other side is just an open piece of bare wire with some insulation that you can grab onto, that should be fine. And if you've got the right value resistor, it might take five or 10 seconds, but that's fine to just touch it on where it needs to go. But I, I personally prefer having two alligator clips to work with. My next tip is to use one of these guys. This is a mo digital multimeter. And what I, main reason I recommend this is to actually take, test the voltage in the amp, right? We, I said before, never work in an amp unless you know for sure that it is safe. Well, this is how you do that. You test the voltage. And when you're using a multimeter, I very much recommend, again, that you use alligator clips. And, and specifically, it's really nice to use two alligator clips for both of your connections. But at a minimum, I would, I would definitely do one. Now, this is a red one, which is kind of confusing, but I'm using this on my common leg. And what I would do is just clip it to this, like this is a bolt here that's bolted to the chassis. So that's like a ground connection that I know of. And now, I don't have to worry about that. I can just bolt the grounded end to the chassis and I can take my other lead and I can poke around with one hand pretty safely in here and test. Uh, I'll show you guys right now how much voltage there is on this filter capacitor. There is no voltage. So now I know for certainty that this amp is safe and I did this exact process before I turned the amp on. I got my, my safety discharge tool, I put it in just like you see it now attach the ground wire, and I got my other leg, and I tested the voltage. So now I know for certainty that it is safe. And I would recommend you do this every single time you open up a tube amp. Let's talk a little bit more about the alligator clips. You know, when I first started, I had my multimeter ends look like this. And so, you know, instead of doing what I just did, where I've got one hand, I actually had two hands. So I would take one hand, and I would like push it against the chassis like this, and I'd take my other hand to take measurements. And I found that this was a very unsafe, I don't know very unsafe, but it was, it was a much more unsafe method to be taking voltages inside an amp because, you know, it, you're prone, especially if you're like taking, trying to do precise measurements on these little tube socket holes, you know, you're prone to, to slipping and your, your eyes are over here on the multimeter and you're trying to hold really still with one hand and then hold really still with the other hand. And I just found it was prone to slipping and making errors and having inadvertent touches. So that's where I really, really highly recommend that you guys get some of these alligator clips and make good use of them. I think that they really help um, to, to make things work. And to that end as well, you know, you want to be very careful when you're using these pointed leads as far as what you're touching. And especially like on these tube sockets, I've had it in the past where I'm trying to touch one tube socket and maybe, you know, it, I'm a little shaky and I kind of slip a little bit and I touch maybe part like the body of my lead on one so one tube socket pin and then the tip maybe touches another and that bridges two connection points that should not be and then you get like a weird spark or a scary moment of you actually um, you actually you know send voltage where it shouldn't be and, and you might cause arcing or damage components or or you know, hurt yourself, right? Maybe your your finger comes into contact with something. So, um, just be kind of cautious about that. And, and even if you're going to take voltages, if you wanted to, there's no reason why you couldn't get two of these alligator clips. Clip one to ground and clip the other one where you want it. Then turn your amp on, let it come and warm up, take your voltage. You're not even sticking your hands in the into the chassis. There is there's no concern using that kind of method. Now you're you know, you're having to turn the amp on and off every time you're doing a taking a voltage test, right? When I do voltage tests, I'm doing every single pin, you know, so that's eight or nine pins on every socket times I don't know three, four, five. So it'll take a little bit while longer, and it gets a little impractical. But for safety, that would be a great way to do it because you really minimize any risk with that method. So then next, if you are going to work inside an amp, notice how I recommended that you have one hand, and the reason for that. You know, you should really be putting your other hand, a lot of guys say, in your pocket. And so, again, that's just that, that ensures that you're not kind of accidentally touching the amp with your off hand when you're not even thinking about it. So if it's in your pocket, you know it's safe and secure, and it's not going to be touching the chassis. And also, to that end, you want to make sure that you're wearing rubber-soled shoes so that you're not, like, standing barefoot on concrete. You know, that will 
give your, again, a path to ground through your feet. You know, so using one hand ensures that even if you do slip and come into contact with voltage, it doesn't have that path through your chest to, to give you that damaging uh, defibrillation type action. Next, I would say, you know, we've talked a lot about filter capacitors, but don't sleep on this 120 volts that's coming from the wall. Don't forget about it. I've never um, personally come into contact with high voltage from a filter cap. But I have contacted the 120 volts AC from the wall, um, where I've, and that's just because I have left the power cord plugged in. Uh, maybe I was doing voltage readings, and in between takes, I didn't unplug the power cord every time. So that 120 volts is flowing, and so just a you know good reminder: don't forget about that 120 volts and and unplug that power cord every time. Then my last tip is just don't get lazy. Um, like I said before, you want to make sure that you have a healthy fear of this voltage. And I think there's just as much concern that you, if you're new, you know, you're going to be kind of hyper alert. But as you get into the hobby and you've done some successful amps and you're taking voltages for the hundredth or the thousandth time, don't fall asleep at the wheel and get lazy. I think that that's even as much of a danger as anything else, that you get a little complacent and you start making assumptions, right? Maybe uh, you've, you've taken voltage in an amp a hundred times and you've never had a filter cap store anything at that point, but then maybe that one time it fails and you have a problem and that's, you know, I think just as dangerous as anything else. So make sure you're keeping on your guard. So those are all my tips. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please let me know your thoughts down below. Stay safe more than anything else. I, I love this hobby and I would love for more people to get involved with it if they are doing so safely. So hope you guys enjoyed this. See you again soon. Take care. Bye.